there! I'm Kina, and this month's STEM Box is exploring the ooey gooey world of blood. So if you're wondering why I'm covered in blood, I promise you should just watch one of our other videos and you'll learn that no one was actually harmed in the making of these films. I promise. So why is blood important? What does it do for us? Well, blood is the life force in humans, life that flows through our hearts and out to the veins and the extremities and the arteries we have in our bodies. So the heart actually can pump seven liters of blood per minute and up to 2,000 gallons a day, when your blood actually only holds up to one and a half gallons, and that's for a big guy. So what is blood even made of? Well, well there's something called a FICOL distribution in a lab. And the FICOL works by separating the components of blood in a centrifuge, which goes really, really fast, based on their density. So we'll start at the top of the FICOL. At the top of the FICOL, you'll find something called the platelet plasma layer. That's little platelets and the blood clotting factors in your blood that keep you from bleeding out when you get a scab. The next layer are your white blood cells, which are actually so important. That's what your immune system is made of. And white blood cells are very cool. White blood cells are the bigger, more nucleated cells in your blood that have the ability to protect you and keep you safe from any pathogenic bacteria or viruses that show up. Things like T cells, B cells, things like macrophages that will recognize an intruder, eat it up, and also keep a part of it as an antigen that they will remember and they can recognize when it comes around again, which is why you build immunity when you get sick. So then, after your white blood cell layer, you have the actual FICOL. There's nothing in it, it's just a dense liquid. So underneath the FICOL layer, you have a very thin layer of red blood cells that are actually nucleated, and these are called granulocytes. Granulocytes are thicker, nucleated red blood cells that have their own immune function. Underneath granulocytes, however, you will find the biggest layer in most FICOL gradient separation. That is the red blood cell layer. Now, red blood cells are especially interesting because they have a great number of priorities they have to do for the body. They bring in all sorts of nutrients, they bring oxygen to the blood, and they release it in the correct places in your body, like your fingers and your toes. So how does it release and pick up oxygen? Well, there's a really cool protein, you may have heard of it, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is this protein that will pick up an iron molecule. This is the iron molecule that comes from your spinach, from your iron supplements, and it's the reason why some people aren't allowed to donate blood or why some people are called anemic. They don't have enough iron that helps make their blood. The way it works is hemoglobin will conform. It'll change shapes because it's a protein. And anytime hemoglobin picks up an iron molecule, it'll change shapes and make a conformation that induces it to pick up more oxygen. So now it can take oxygen to the different parts of your body, release it where it needs to, and continue on its way. The other interesting thing about oxygen in the blood is you can actually see how much oxygen is in someone's blood when they bleed. So you don't need to go like cut open your sister and see her bleed to see this. You can look it up on the internet and just like use parent safe search. But look up oxygenated levels of blood. This means that the more oxygen is in your blood, the lighter color it becomes. It becomes the most vibrant bright red. But as uh, blood becomes deoxygenated, say it's been scabbing up or it's been bleeding out for a minute or two, the blood will start to look dark red until it gets to dark, 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 blackish, brownish red. Now that we understand the components of blood and why it is so important to us and our bodies, it's really interesting to start to think about the medical implications that research on blood can have. For instance, there are different labs that research just the most basic components of blood. blood how it works, why it's important to us, and other things that we may not have known about in different proteins in blood that are so important that we still don't know the names of. And then, there are certain genetic diseases in blood. There are things like SCID. SCID is a disease called bubble boy disease. It means that you don't have an immune system. So right now, there are actually genetic therapies that are being used to replace that broken gene in the blood and fix it so that these people will have an immune system. Besides research, there's a very valuable component of blood in our communities, and that's actually donations. Donations to blood banks are such an important factor in medicine because millions of people need blood every day, transfusions from sicknesses, from accidents, and it's something that you can do directly to help people. It's really interesting too because if you donate, you can find out your blood type. And speaking of blood type, it turns out that there are 30 variations of blood types, but the most common are a theme on A, B, O, and A, B. I'm personally an A positive, which actually makes me feel very smart when I'm feeling a little bit down about myself. 
There are only so many combinations of alleles that could lead to your possible blood type. So alleles and blood types are actually a really useful way to determine someone's parentage. If they don't know who their dad is or their mom is, it's a really easy way for someone to test if they think someone might be. And it's a very common thing used in a lot of investigations. Beyond donations and research, blood is also extremely useful for murder investigations, crime investigations, and forensic science. It's actually a whole field unto itself. In the experiment we did earlier in this box, we did blood splatters. And this is something that forensic scientists use over and over again to determine different trajectories, angles, and what might have happened during a crime scene, which is so exciting that we can actually explore those direct methods. Now, I know that we've talked about some really cool factual science things here, but I think we should also probably talk about the really crazy weird things people used to do with blood. So, back, 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 back when America first started, our first president, George Washington, became very ill at the end of his life. He actually was seen by doctors who thought that the best thing for his sick blood was to let it out. This is called blood letting. We don't do this in such a fashion anymore. In some cases it is used, but not often. So the doctors for George Washington let out his blood. They let out about half of his blood in a matter of hours. And this is unfortunately what led to him dying. And before George Washington's unfortunate demise, there were researchers in the age of reasoning back in France during the 1600s who were doing a lot of experiments on blood because no one had ever done them before. There was one physician who was French back in 1667. He wanted to see if the blood of a lamb, a very calm, sedate creature, could cure the psychosis of an ill man. So what they did is they found a guy to volunteer. They took him, they hooked him up to a lamb, and they switched blood. They put the lamb blood in the guy. And basically, he just didn't die. And that was what they considered a huge success. That was the first xenograft transplant. That means a transplant between a human and an animal. So recently, we actually circled back to this crazy xenograft idea, but less xenograft, more species to species. And that mice were being studied for the transfer of young mouse blood to old mice. See, old mice are not good at running mazes. They kind of forget. They're kind of grumpy and they just want to eat the cheese and they don't know where to go. But young mice have their eye on the prize and young mice are like, yeah, I can do this maze. I totally remember this. So they go through it with ease. Yet, when they switched the blood of an old mouse into a young mouse, they found that the young mice could not complete the maze without forgetting it. But when they switched young mouse blood into old mice, they found that the old mice all of a sudden were remembering these mazes. You guys have been fantastic. Thank you so much for listening. And I really hope that you were able to take away some very big excitement and lessons from this lesson on blood. 